The first point is that wages aren't the price of labour, as is held in, class in neoclassical economics. I'll then go on to the classical theory of the reproduction of labour power, the time scales and speed of response with which this mechanism operates. I'll then present a stochastic version of the Marxian theory of wages and then look at the effect of population change. If you do an economics course, you will be told that wages are a payment for work done. This is the conventional view. And the conventional view is also that there is a fair exchange in this process and that unequal wages are due to unequal merit or unequal value of people's labour. And insofar as there is a moral theory brought forward, it is that the moral theory is that work of equal value should be paid the same. Marx's view is different from this. Wages are not a payment for work. Wages are payment for the ability to work. And the value of the ability to work is always less than the value of the work done. Hence, rather than being a fair exchange, it's an exploitative relationship. And insofar as you get unequal wages, these unequal wages are due to inequalities in the cost of reproducing labour power. So that skilled labour, which requires training, costs more to produce and therefore has a higher value. Or rather, skilled labour power has a higher value. And the consequence of that is that the moral principle that work of equal value should be paid the same is something that can only be achieved in a non-capitalist economy. It can only be achieved in a planned socialist economy. To get a better handle on what is meant by the value of labour power, or indeed the idea of labour power itself, we can look at horsepower, the power of a car engine. And it's arguable that had not the idea of horsepower already been developed when Marx was writing, it would have been hard for him to come up with the idea of an ability to work that was distinct from the work done. Now, if you buy a car, it may have 100 horsepower, 200 horsepower. But this isn't actually the amount of power or work that's put out. The amount of work that put out in a given amount of time depends on the speed you're driving at. So the faster you drive, the more joules of output are used. The more horsepower seconds of output are used. The same applies to factory work. If a factory owner can speed up the work that his employees are doing, if he can get them to work longer and more intensely, he gets more labour out of them. What he's paid for at the start of the day is their ability to work. How hard and fast he gets them to work is up to him. It's just like speeding up a car. The exploitation consists in the fact that the value of labour power, the ability to work, can be reproduced in only a few hours during the day. In this case, I've shown it being reproduced in the hours nine to one. If the worker is employed until five o'clock, the remaining four hours of the working day contribute surplus value. If the worker can be made to work until six o'clock, then there's a further hour producing surplus. So a key means of increasing surplus value is in, to increase the working day. The other would be to reduce the value of labour power. And that reduction can take place in two ways. It can either be due to forcing down real living standards, or it can be due to the improvement in the technologies of producing the things that people consume in their real wage so that they can be made in fewer hours. This is a key point to grasp. In a capitalist society, nobody, absolutely nobody, is paid the value of the labour. 
the call for people to be paid the value of their labour is ultimately illusory. They're never paid for their labour. They're only paid for what it costs to reproduce the ability to work. Now, obviously, that's made up of several components. Cost of feeding people, cost of training people, the cost of raising the next generation of workers. Now, prior to Marx, there was the classical Ricardian theory of wages, which is sometimes called the Iron Law of Wages, and comes from Ricardo and Malthus. The basic theory was that if wages rise, more people will be reproduced. Families will be bigger and infant mortality will be lower. That means the population rises. As a result, there is more competition for work. Increasing competition for work leads to lower wages, higher infant mortality, and therefore the population shrinks again. The classical economists argued that as a consequence of this, wages would inevitably stay near a subsistence minimum. They could never rise much above the bare level required to support survival of the working class. Okay, was the Ricardian theory true? Did the evidence back it up? Well, we have to say yes. Here I produce from the work of Clark a time series of, along the top, the evolution of wages in Britain or in England. This is just agricultural wages presented here, but a similar movement occurs of other rates of wages which have been able to be discovered by historians. At the bottom there is a graph line showing the population, therefore the labour supply. As you can see, the level of wages is a mirror image of the labour supply. When the labour supply is growing, wages are falling, as predicted in the classical theory of wages. Then, in the 1300s, 1349, the Great Plague, the Black Death, occurs. There's a following series of outbreaks of the plague for the next 50 to 100 years. The net effect was to produce a very steep fall in the population between 1340 and 1350 and a continuing decline in the population for most of the next century. So what happened? Wages shot up and continued to rise with wages peaking in 1450. After that, what happens? The population starts to recover as a result of wages being high and in consequences wages start to fall. Then in the late 1600s there's another outbreak of plague. The population falls a bit more. In consequences wages rise. After the plague dies down population starts to grow again and wages start falling again. The relationship only change changes after 1800, after the introduction of machine industry and the capitalist mode of production. So the period that Malthus and Ricardo were observing, the period before 1800, the classical law of wages certainly applied. And it's worth noting that even in 1860, which is taken as the, these are wage indexes, so everything is expressed relative to the real wage in 1860. In 1860, real wages were still lower than in 1460. So despite maybe 70 years of capitalist industrialization, living standards are still not caught up to the peak that had been achieved in the Middle Ages. Nonetheless, the inverse relationship 
the simple inverse relationship between wages and population was beginning to break down after 1800. The fact that the relationship broke down in the 19th century is held by most people nowadays to be a fatal flaw of the Ricardian or Malthusian theory, or it is held at least by economists to be a fatal flaw. Economic historians have a rather different view of it. We have to ask, why was it that the relationship broke down in the early 19th century? Well, the first reason is obviously that the use of machinery, the specifically capitalist mode of production, allows the surplus to rise even when real wages rose, because it allows consumer goods to be produced with fewer hours of labour and therefore the living standard can rise and the surplus can rise at the same time provided the labour productivity rises faster than real wages. But the other big change was that Britain colonised Canada and the Canadian wheat fields became available to feed the British population. As a result, food prices fell. And this fall in food prices was a big contributing factor to the fact that you could get a rise in living standards even as the rate of surplus value rose. But that's a one-off process. The conquest of new land and bring it in under agriculture is a one-off process. In the 20th century, an analogous process occurred in continental Europe. One of the main drivers of classical imperialism was the drive to obtain farming colonies to feed the metropolis. Britain had already acquired land in Canada, Australia, New Zealand. Other imperial powers thought that it was necessary to acquire equivalent land to feed their metro metropolitan populations. However, from the late 20th century, this drive drops down. And the key reason is the development of the harbour process, which enabled raising the agricultural productivity within continental Europe the application of artificial fertilisers produced by the harbour process which combines nitrogen and hydrogen to make pneumo uh, ammonia, the harbour process allowed food production to be raised within continental Europe. And that removed the pressure to acquire settler colonies to grow food. But again, that's arguably a once-off process. In the Marxian theory, wages are still the price of reproducing an ability to work, so it carries over much of the Ricardian theory. The problem with this is that the feedback mechanism in the classical theory of wages is very slow. It occupies centuries to take an effect. We could see that in the graphs I presented on the evolution of wages from the Middle Ages in Britain. It's a slow process. If one's talking about a dynamic capitalist economy, you have to ask, what is the dynamic mechanism which keeps wages at a level sufficient to reproduce labour power? Why should employers worry about a next generation? It's not going to be here for 25 years. Why not just drive wages down below the level at which the next generation can survive? Well, we'll look at Those of you who have looked at my other videos will know that I am keen on taking a stochastic or a conophysics approach to understanding classical political economy and Marxist political economy. Now, one of the key things that you have to understand from an econophysics approach is that 
everything, each economic variable has a distribution. It's not a single value. There isn't a single wage. There is always a spread of wage rates. And the mathematician Benoit Mandelbrot, the same guy who discovered the Mandelbrot set, established in the early 1960s that the statistical form of the wage distribution is what's called a log-normal distribution. I've plotted a log-normal distribution here. Now, the log-normal distribution is what you get when you have a multiplicity of independently acting random factors producing a result where these random factors multiply together to produce the result. And that appears to be what governs the shape of the wage distribution. Now, given that distribution, we have to say what determines its mean and what determines its spread. Well, one of the factors entering into determining the, the mean of it, and the spread for that matter, is that you cannot have a significant number of people working at a wage that is below the starvation level for a single person. So that means that the wage distribution has to start at starvation level for a single person. A, fa a wage earner who is supporting a family on one wage is not going to be able to take such a job. They will therefore only be willing to work for a wage which can at least support the whole family at around starvation level. So you get two factors here. The starvation level for one person, the starvation level for a family. You can have a certain number of people below the starvation level for a family, depend on the number of single workers. And this then gives us the shape of the log normal distribution that will apply. Now it may seem that I'm being unrealistic in talking about starvation in developed capitalist countries. Surely that's something far in the past, but no, it's not. Look at the figures given by the US food and agriculture population. Of the percentage of households in the US who are food insecure, people who are food insecure in general are malnourished. They are unable to afford enough for a healthy diet. People on very low food security are people who are defined as going hungry. So that 5%, 5.5% 5 .5 of US households are going hungry. These are de those who are down at the bottom end of it. They are people whose wage is below that necessary to subsist on for a whole family. Food and Agricultural Organization says there are 48 million people in that position in the United States. These people are on wages that is not enough to physically survive without federal or charitable food aid. And the same process has occurred in Britain more recently under the, the recent Tory government, with vast numbers of people dependent on charitable food handouts. In the classical theory, competition in the labour market was due to population increase. In a capitalist economy, there's an additional type of competition caused by a fluctuating reserve army of labour. Next, I'm going to show how a classic 19th century accumulation cycle of the type that Marx was familiar with in the 1860s and 1870s operated. I'm taking actually the cycle that immediately followed his death. 
OK, this is a pair of diagrams to show an accumulation cycle. The top one shows the rate of change of money wages against the level of unemployment. The bottom one shows the rate of change of money wages against the accumulation rate, how much of profits were being reaccumulated. We'll start at the end of the last cycle, the period 1881 to 1883. If we look at the accumulation diagram, we see accumulation was positive. In consequence, unemployment was low. And in 1881 and 1882, at least, wages were rising. We move on to the next phase of the cycle. The, the, the two diagrams move in opposite directions. Clockwise for the bottom diagram, counterclockwise for the upper diagram. During this period, accumulation is falling and becomes negative. In consequence of this, unemployment rises. And because of that, wages are falling. High unemployment, falling wages from 1884 to 1886. The changeover is occurring in 1887 of the cycle. During the upswing of the cycle, accumulation is positive or rising. And as a result, unemployment is falling and that means wages are rising. So we have a cyclical process here which dynamically regulates the level of wages. This was called by Marx the general law of capitalist accumulation. The growth of the working population still acts as a long-term determinant of the rate of exploitation and rate of profit. The other main determinant is the share of profit being accumulated. And these cyclical movements are superimposed on long-term demographic trends. You can test this combination of factors by looking at a large number of years and a large number of countries. I have taken 1,220 individual year samples across 30 countries with data provided in the extended pen world tables. And I've looked at the relationship between the birth rate, which is the main driver of the growth of the population and the working population, and the rate of surplus value. And you can see that the higher the birth rate, the higher the rate of surplus value. 35% correlation between the birth rate and the rate of surplus value. You also find a correlation between the rate of accumulation and the rate of surplus value. But this, as you would expect from Marx's theory, is negative. A minus 56% correlation, or negative correlation. And there is a certain correlation, a certain positive correlation, between the number of people employed and the rate of surplus value, or the change in the number of people employed. So as the number of people being employed grows, the rate of surplus value tends to be higher. This you would expect to be less of marked than the correlation with the birth rate, which is the underlying long-term demographic trend. It's less marked because the total workforce is made up of those unemployed as well as those who are employed. So the correlation from with those employed will be slightly weaker. We can take an example of a country with a high birth rate and a high rate of growth of the labour force by looking at South Africa. Here you can see the shape of the the trend of the working population in South Africa. And you can see it is very rapidly rising, in fact, rising at an accelerating rate. The consequence of that is that 
South Africa has a rising long-term rate of profit. The rate of profit rises rapidly because the number of workers is rising very quickly. It's rising faster than the capital available to employ them. What can we take away and this us? means both that the rate of exploitation well, rises and that the surplus is per that the sum of capital force, invested has historically rises. historically been the key factor in determining exploitation rates. That's most clearly shown by the long-term historical time series going over centuries. And it's still absolutely vital. It hasn't gone away because of industrialization. It can be partially offset by very rapid capital accumulation, which absorbs new workers, or by major new inventions. You have to repudiate the liberal idea, which wants to dissociate the growth of the workforce with the level of exploitation and level of wages. In particular, the idea that immigration doesn't increase exploitation. This suggestion is actually quite contrary to the Marxist theory of the reserve army of labour and, as I'll show, it's contrary to the historical data as well. The effect of immigration into a country is to increase the reserve army of labour. And according to Marxist theory, an increase in the reserve army of labour will lead to a higher rate of exploitation. And if you actually look at empirical data and plot the rate of exploitation against the rate of immigration, you find, as predicted in Marxist theory, that you get a positive relationship. The higher the rate of, of immigration, the higher the rate of exploitation. So there is a positive relationship between them and it does no credit to socialist organisations to merely echo liberal theory on this. But if we look at the big picture, the big picture at a world scale is that fertility is declining. It's declining towards reproduction levels. And that means the growth of the working population on a world scale is slowing down. And the necessary consequence of that is that at a world scale, the conditions of negotiating the wage bargain are better for the working class than they were in the past. They're improving. There is a reduction in the oversupply of labour power at a world scale. And if you f look at this graph, that is the decline in fertility in East Asia and the Pacific, primarily China, dominated by China. And you can see the very rapid decline in fertility. That's leading the world trend. Now, this effect of declining fertility combined with rapid accumulation leading to fast wage increases can be seen in China. Because world fertility is slowing down, the low birth rate combined with rapid accumulation leads to rapidly rising wages. This is the trend of wages in China. These are the trends in India and Indonesia. You see, almost flatlining. Thailand shows some improvement. Vietnam also shows rapid improvement. These rapid improvements are the result of macroeconomic planning by a socialist government, which is attempting to control the growth of the labour su supply and at the same time keep the accumulation rate high in order to allow wages and living standards to increase. In that last graph, I contrasted China with India and Indonesia. Here I'm contrasting China with the leading Western capitalist countries, USA and the Federal Republic of Germany. Again, I'm plotting labor unit, index of la unit labor costs here. Labor costs are rising rapidly in China. They've more than doubled in 50, 14 years. 
flatlining or declining in the USA and Germany. That is a direct result of the neoliberal economic model which aims to rapidly increase the labour supply whilst having a low rate of accumulation and this leads to stagnant or falling wages. So the final conclusion is both of the factors the rate of accumulation and the rate of growth of the population a working population are vital to understanding the condition that people face selling their labour power. If the labour force is rising rapidly and the accumulation is slow, wages will be stagnant or declining. If the growth of the labour force is slow or fixed and accumulation is rapid, then the wage share will rise and real wages will rise.